a coordinated campaign of stunts directed and staged beforehand by the Democrats. Mr. Judge Chairman. Brett Kavanaugh. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I appeal to be recognized. Mr. Chairman, I agree with my colleagues. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. You're out of order. I'll proceed. In the Federalist Papers. Surely I would. Mr. 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 Chairman. Senator Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman if, if we cannot be recognized, I move to adjourn. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, I move to adjourn. The role of the... He's written more than 300 opinions. His opinions span nearly 5,000 pages in length. What are, what's remarkable about Judge Kavanaugh's judicial record? Paid for by CatholicVote.org, not coordinated by any candidate's committee. And now I am joined again by Nate Madden, who is at CRTV. He's a great commentator. He actually just put out a column uh, about this week's events, and the, the title of the column was, It's High Time to End the SCOTUS Hearing Circus for Good. So first of all, thank you very much for joining us, Nate. Uh, thanks for having me, Steve. It's good to be back on. Well, you know, I think that actually, Nate, you are representative, I think, of a rising generation. One way to put it would be a rising generation, but also of a mood shift, I think, maybe more broadly um, in America, especially among politically uh, attentive people, that might be a good move. You're talking about the SCOTUS nomination hearing and how it's theater, it's it's tiresome, it's coordinated, and, and it doesn't actually pertain— to the common good or to policy making uh, in a way that the public actually benefits from. Your exasperation with this hearing, it's the opposite of the sort of viewership of Jerry Springer's show. And at the same time, I think it actually might be, like I said, representative of a cultural shift. What do you think of that idea? Broadly speaking, ironically, in the time of Donald Trump's tr presidency, do you think that America might be tired? <laughs> Of, of 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 theatrical politics? I think theatrical politics are definitely exhausting. I'm just thinking about how many years of my life that I've added in the past, good grief, three years, covering everything from the the, the initial GOP primaries to now. But no, I, I, the, I don't know how many people share my exasperation. It's but you realize after a while you watch things like this, especially these Supreme Court nomination confirmation hearings, they're like fake wrestling, like fake TV wrestling for politics nerds, all right? The yeah. entire thing is planned. The entire thing is scripted out on both sides. The, 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 everyone, the, the winner's already decided before everybody walks into the room. Uh, it's all being put on just for show and just as a spectacle at this point because we don't find out anything new. But people still watch it for the fight. And really mm -hmm. and truly, the fight is exasperating because when you have... 70 protesters in the first day being dragged out of a Senate hearing room for getting up and screaming about abortions or guns or whatever they want. And then you have almost, uh, I, I haven't even seen tallies of the arrest today yet, um, talking after coming after day two. But you see this, this is, this is supposed to be the greatest deliberative body in the history of the world, but they can't deliberate because they've got people screaming. And they don't deliberate because really and truly, when you go through the line of questioning, on one side you have people who are asking a bunch of gotcha questions, despite the fact that almost everybody in that room had their mind made up about this guy the minute he was nominated right. because of who nominated him on both sides. And then on the yeah. other side of that, in contrast to all the gotcha questions that aren't really going to tell us anything new, You've got a bunch of softball answers that are designed to give this guy an opportunity to say things like, I'm a pro-law judge, I decide with the Constitution, all these different platitudes, because they're coached on platitudes. Gorsuch right. was coached on platitudes. They have to be coached on platitudes because really and truly with the, with the nominee standard they have, we can't have a conversation about somebody's legal philosophy. We can't right. have a real conversation about whether or not these cases were were poorly decided in the first place. We can't have a conversation about any of the important things we need to have a conversation about. So you end up having one side of the aisle that is going to demonize this guy, regardless of what is actually said in this room, and another side that is going to throw softballs to give him opportunities right. to say as many good things and as many head, like happy platitudinal things as he can in the course of uh, the 20 minutes that are allotted for their question time. 
Well, you know, it's funny because also, you know, from the perspective, from my perspective, from the perspective of, of, a, of a guy who's very passionate about the few causes that I care deeply about, right? I'm an extremist. So whatever comes out of this is not going to be very pleasing to me, right? Kavanaugh might be a nominee from a president that I voted for. And nonetheless, and, and who sort of represents generally the consensus of the party that I belong to, right? And nonetheless, you know what? If I really want... If I really want strong uh, affirmations of of my deepest held beliefs, I go to sermons and I go to podcasts. And I go to I go to punditry and I go to uh, intellectual uh, articles and journals that I that are my favorites. Maybe it's time that we separate that kind of deliberative activity, where we share ideas and we have these conversations, from these. Events like the SCOTUS nomination hearings, which are honestly pretty perfunctory, right? They are. I mean, they're not actually going. To, in other words, the, the hearings that we're that we're living through right now, that we're surviving right now, mm-hmm. aren't actually uh, aren't actually uh, deliberative. They're not actually going to lead to one effect or another. There's nothing at stake here, is there? No, not not, not whatsoever. And the thing to also remember is we didn't have. Senate confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominees until Louis Brandeis in 1916. And nominees didn't even speak on their own behalf until Felix Frankfurter in 1939. We got along for almost a century and a half without grilling these guys in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. We went even longer than that without putting it all on television cameras. Right. Right. And of course, they want to cast this. Oh, this is their this is the the job application, the job interview they have for the American people. How much of a job interview is it when you walk into a room? Half the people who are there are there to make you look bad. And the other half are only there to throw softball questions. so You can talk about how wonderful you are. That is not a job interview. There is nothing to be gained. <laughs> you had something like there were 22 Democratic senators who had already voiced whether or not they were going to vote for this guy before the hearing even started. And you know the actual number is going to be more. There are some in the middle, but I can guarantee you that there is absolutely nothing that will come out of this hearing that is going to affect whether or not those swing Democrats in those red states are actually going to buckle to pressure and vote for Brett Kavanaugh. That's completely contingent on what happens out on the campaign trail. And why? Because despite all the shouting and shrieking everything else, all of these answers are rehearsed, all these answers are prepared, and they're designed to be complete deflective non-answers. That's just the way that Supreme Court nominees are coached. Uh, the, uh, there's talk about you know separating these deliberative things from a perfunctory process. I, I think there, for our national mental health, there are two ways we can go, right? We can either make the perfunctory process deliberative and hashtag great again, and find a way to do this without the protesters or the cameras, you know, find a way to actually deliberate these guys, which we know isn't going to happen in a nuclear Senate when everything is hyperpartisan these days. Or right. you just simply stop having the perfunctory thing until you can get your crap straight and actually debate something. Right. And, and, and you know what? I mean, when we're talking about the Supreme Court, that's probably the furthest thing in, in our founding fathers' arrangement of the government, right? The furthest thing from the kind of, fr- from, let's say, presidential primary debates would probably be SCOTUS nominations. Yeah. Right? Uh, good grief. Uh, when, <laughs> when, when the framers were designing the, what was supposed to be the weakest branch of government, I, I, I think they, they, they might projectile vomit if they realized that this was going to be such a big issue in, in presidential elections and such a contentious issue. And it, because it's an issue that because of the court reaches into almost every aspect of our lives. You know, this, there's right. so much anxiety over these things because the court itself is too powerful. The lower courts yeah. themselves are too powerful. We have a legislature that does very little, and we have a super legislature that does way too much at almost every level. Well, the, you know, let me stop you right there. This, this does concern me, right? So I pay attention to politics, and I pay attention to our culture, and therefore I look at a person like I look at a Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I think she's actually kind of a radical, and that's to paraphrase uh, Diane Feinstein in her uh, in her interview with uh, with uh, with Amy Coney Barrett. That's of concern. If you're going to be potentially sitting on the Supreme Court, and I know that you are uh, you're pretty radically progressive, that's very much of concern to me. That matters to me, and because I'm a conservative. And then, meanwhile, you have people on the opposite end of the aisle saying to Amy Coney Barrett. I'm really concerned because, Amy, you go to mass every day, right? Right. 
so th- this partisanship really d- has definitely come to a head in judiciary hearings. Well, the partisan- and that shouldn't be, should it? And why? Well, the partisanship is only natural because what we have is a situation where our judges are so partisan in the way they act. Mm-hmm. Look at all the wacky decisions that you get out of lower courts on a daily to weekly basis. Look at all the things that judges rule on now and all the manufactured rights that we have to deal with that aren't that were never supposed to be the realm of the judiciary. This is something that in the Obergefell dissent and in Scalia called this social transformation without representation. All right. I think uh-huh. it's one of the catchiest things he ever wrote, but it happens every single day and it's been happening for decades. I mean, as, as Catholics, let's talk about the sexual revolution here. Every major victory of the sexual revolution didn't come from the legislature. It came from the courts. Whether you're talking about contraception in Griswold, when you're talking about abortion in Roe and Casey, when you're talking about sodomy laws in Lawrence v. Texas, when you're talking about gay marriage laws with uh, Windsor and then following with Obergefell, every single – and eventually, at some point, they're going to have an employee non-discrimination ruling one way or the other. And without Kennedy there, who knows how that's going to go. But again, if Kennedy were still on there, you can bet that that would have been the next big victory for the sexual revolution types. Right. right? They would all come from the judiciary. Every single one of yeah. these. And on other issues where we see you know, everything that – Donald Trump can't scratch his nose without getting a temporary injunction or some other sort of court order to stop him from scratching his nose from somewhere out in the lower courts. And right. they have to well, haggle and wait for it to get up to the Supreme Court. It, and so what you're seeing is not only is the judiciary undermining the legislative branch, which is something that conservatives and constitutionalists have complained about forever. They're undermining yeah. the executive branch because Trump. Yeah. Well, you know what bothers me about this, Nate, is that in all of that we that you're complaining about here, and that I'm complaining with you about, who is left hung out to dry? Who is most likely to have one pulled over on them in this scenario? In my view, it would be probably the the libertarian when it comes to people who are actually politically engaged would be the most screwed over by this. But more broadly speaking. Anyone who actually doesn't directly participate in, in partisan politics, especially two-party politics, it's, it's, kind of gets screwed over by this. And, I, and, and as a Catholic, that really concerns me because we're talking about the common good. Because what we're talking about is social extremes being judicially enforced. And that comes out—that actually pans out legislatively in the long run. And people who are not directly politically involved— are the ones who are most likely to be blindsided by what you just mentioned Antonin Scalia called cultural change without representation. They're the most likely to suffer consequences that they had no role in bringing about. And that's totally against our view of humanity and and, and civil society, especially as Catholics who have a really high value, who hold in high esteem the principle of subsidiarity. You know, it shouldn't be a, a. We shouldn't be a nation full of activists and direct participants in politics. We should be a nation of mostly just human beings, with a few people who take it upon themselves, out of a sense of duty toward the common good, uh, uh, to to ensure that common good through uh, political involvement. Am I wrong there? What do you think of that assessment? You're not wrong. I, I see three groups there. Uh, I, I see people who want to be left alone. If you want to call those folks libertarians or whatever, people who simply right. want to be left alone. You have the people who live their day-to-day lives without thinking that much about this. And for everything, it's the, it's the frog in the pot just being turned up degree by yeah. degree because folks aren't paying attention to what's going on around exactly. them. And this, this right. comes back and bites them in that respect. And then, of course, you have the people who simply want to have autonomy over the parts of their lives that they should have either personal, local, or state-level autonomy over. People who want to who, who dare to want to say in how they live their lives – over the whims of a bunch of faraway judges and bureaucrats elsewhere in the United States. Those are the people most affected. Right. And it it marches on. Yeah, that's right, it does. Well, thank you for tooting, uh, tooting the horn and, and shouting halt, standing athwart <laughs> the judiciary system and the, uh, the SCOTUS hearing and shouting stop, uh, you know, Buckley style. And uh, I look forward to having you on again soon. But to our viewers, do keep in mind, Nate Madden is a commentator that you never want to miss an emanation of. So do do pay attention to his commentary, his latest column. It's high time to end the SCOTUS hearing circus for good can be found over at conservativereview.com. And he's also the host of CRTV's Capitol Hill Brief. 
Capitol Hill brief where you can find his commentary on, a, a, well, several times a week. So thank you again, Nate, for coming on the show, and I look forward to having you on again soon. Thanks for having me. Take care, brother.